Well, welcome everyone to the first Teton Photography Club educational program of the year. Tonight, we're going to explore how you can learn using your Lightroom catalog. My name is Lauren Nelson, and tonight we're going to look at Lightroom uh, through the eyes of the library more than we are uh, to look at image editing. We know Lightroom has a lot of capabilities, but the thing we really want to focus on tonight is the ability to find images, to organize our Lightroom catalog, and to be able to recover these images so we can understand better how our photography style uh, is demonstrated in our actual imaging. Now, everyone knows that Lightroom is a photo database, and as a database, we have to do upfront work to save a massive amount of work uh, later downstream, and that's what we're going to try to focus on this evening. Now, there are two important things that we have to understand in how Lightroom displays various information, and that is the physical or the real information where our images are located versus the virtual, which is how we're going to be able to show things. So the physical information is the drive where we are storing the images themselves, and that's fundamental, and it's probably the biggest mistake that most people make. Uh, is setting up a, a file structure that is something that doesn't work over the long term. So we'll spend a little bit of time looking at how you can best optimize your file structure. But the real power of Lightroom lies in the virtual organization that gives us so much flexibility in how we do our images. Now, the physical file uh, structure is relatively slow in the creation, the access, alteration, because everything has to be written to uh, a disk drive. Uh, but this risk of the, the being dependent upon this uh, physical information is that it can be affected by other external programs. You can go in with a file manager or finder, and you can actually move images, uh, and Lightroom will no longer know where those images are. So we have to be very careful about doing all of our movement and our renaming and whatnot within the Lightroom program, as opposed to using external programs. And finally, of course, we have to back up our images uh, with some sort of a manual backup plan. We've talked about this in previous classes. Now, the virtual organization in Lightroom gives us amazing flexibility. First of all, it's extremely fast, almost instantaneous in being able to find images. And second of all, it's protects, protected uh, from outside programs and other applications because it's all embedded within the Lightroom catalog where other programs can't get in and change any of our virtual organization. The third thing is that it is all automatically saved in the catalog. And if we use the best workflow of uh, having Lightroom uh, uh, duplicate the catalog and back up the catalog every time we log out, then we have a second copy of that catalog always available if we were to have a drive problem. Next, the virtual organization stuff requires almost no drive space whatsoever. In fact, you can store uh, about 1,000 virtual images uh, in the same amount of space that it takes to have one real image physically stored on your hard drive. We can reorganize and view these images multiple different ways. It saves time and it helps us uh, find our images more quickly, uh, as well as telling us a little bit about how we're photographing, what we're doing with photographs, which is the subject of tonight's program. Finally, we can use some of these virtual organization techniques to optimize our workflow. Again, that's the subject of another class. So in the library module, there are three important workflows that we think about. We have an import workflow, which is outlined here. We have a search workflow, <coughs> excuse me, which will be the topic of tonight's program. And we have an export workflow. But what we're going to look at most importantly tonight is in the import workflow about renaming our images, getting them in proper folder structure, and being sure that we're adding core keywords as we get started. <clears throat> now, Lightroom uses a number of special identifiers. One of these are called flags, where we can set keyboard shortcuts six through nine that give you no color coding or any of these choices. 
uh, everybody has to come up with a way they like to do it. For me, uh, I'm always concerned about posting things to social media. I don't want to post something that I posted previously. So when I do select something for a social media post, it gets a blue flag. Uh, if I'm doing a presentation slideshow, it gets a green flag. Uh, if it's something uh, unique or special or a project I'm working on, I want to come back and work on it again, it gets a yellow flag. And if it's something that I have printed for myself or for a client, it gets a red flag. And you just have to kind of work out something. The most important thing I can say about color coding is you just have to be consistent uh, in whatever means you, you choose to do. Uh, Lightroom also has a stacking function where like images can be pulled together. Uh, I'm sure people use this. I use this thing for all HDR images, panorama images, focus stacking images. Um, I do this because I only want to see the final result. If I put, you know, three, five, or seven images into a, uh, you know, high definition, uh, you know, uh, a high dynamic range image, an HDR type image, uh, I don't want to see one of those intentionally overexposed or underexposed images or I might do something to it which would ruin the final HDR product. Similarly with a panorama, you know, if I've done a, a seven or a 10 shot panorama and I'm looking through my images and I see this corner of a mountain someplace, I'm likely to delete that image. But then I realize, oh, wait a minute, no, that's part of a panorama. So I stack these. So the only thing that you see uh, in the grid view or when you, when you pull your images up is the final edition of the panorama. So that's a bunch of the special identifiers we're gonna to use tonight. And the very last thing are the keywords. Uh, keywords make the database powerful, make it robust and make it very, very specific in the search uh, functions that are available. So I, I will strongly urge people to use keywords and, and use them very liberally. Uh, Lightroom has the ability to do keyword groups. So if I pick out a subject of an image and it's a moose, Lightroom says, oh, that moose is an ungulate. Oh, that ungulate is a mammal. And, oh, that mammal is a, a member of fauna. So I, I can get all of those different words in. And if somebody says, geez, I just need a, uh, an image of, of something out in the snow and it's, it's gotta be an animal. I could pull up fauna and oh, it's gotta be a mammal. It's gotta be an ungulate, you know, whatever. Uh, and it really does help you get very specific. Now, people constantly say, what should you use for keywords? And it depends entirely on your style of photography. And that's what we're gonna be focused on tonight. And that's what you're gonna be learning about tonight. Generally, I think keywords need to tell you something about where an image was taken. And you'll see how I do combinations of these with, if I'm doing travel photography or if I'm reasonably close to home. Uh, it needs to tell you something about when. Uh, and I put seasonal information on. For example, I know that October is traditionally fall, but hey, we live in Jackson. If there's snow on the ground, it gets called winter. If it's May, if there's snow on the ground, it gets called winter. I still have the date, I can still find it. Okay, it was a picture that was shot in May, but if somebody says I need a picture of an animal in the snow, I can pull up winter and I'm likely to get that sort of image. Uh, a lot of people like to put in the genre that they're shooting. Is it a landscape image? Is it a portrait? You know, is it wildlife? Is it street photography, architecture? Heaven forbid it's wedding photography or family. You know, if, if you have those things, you may wanna have that as one of your key words. Uh, I like to put in special techniques. If I'm doing panorama, HDR, focus stacking, macro, night photography, I usually put that word in. I can pull that up again very, very quickly. Of course, you want your general subject. If you've got a person in the image, you want their name. You, know, you may want to use taxonomy like I put up above. Uh, you may want to categorize this by some type of, of images and mountain images or so on and so forth. Uh, certainly, if, if you're a professional, you're going to want things like the name of the shoot, the job, uh, you know, if you're using a studio, you know, if you have a contract, if you're shooting for a particular client, uh, those could be very specific. The only thing I say is the more of the keywords you use, the better it is. It helps the specificity of the search. Now, there's one no-no that I'll say about keywords, and that is don't use EXIF information, that exposure information from your camera 
or metadata. It's already there. It's silly to waste time putting that kind of information in uh, as key words. So that's about all I have to say to preface this. Let me hide this and right now open up. Are there any questions about terminology? Or any of the thoughts about how you're using the library functions of Lightroom? Or can we dive right into it? Because that's going to be the fun stuff. A question. Yeah, Eric. If, if your camera records the GPS information, do you still want to have state, city, location in your library? Probably don't need it. Uh, one of the things you'll see is if you do have GPS information, Lightroom is really clever and it will tell you the city name that you are closest to when you took that picture. I just found that out just a, a month ago. I had no idea that it does that. So the information is there. Um, and I will show you that in a little bit about how searching using GPS information is different than searching using keyword information. And you can decide which would work best for you. Thank you. Yeah. That it? Now, let me go ahead and uh, bring in Lightroom. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, maximize that so hopefully you can see it. And this, is, this is interesting. Now, from now on, this is new uncharted territory. And I will tell you, nobody, nobody has ever seen my Lightroom catalog. Even my wife, you know? And I, I was thinking about that the other day. Now, why is that? You know, it's so personal, your Lightroom catalog and how you set things up. I get, it tells you something about your inner mind, number one. The more I thought about it, it's kind of like having your neighbor coming over and having you show them your underwear drawer. You know, and you, you pull out the pair of boxers that got the smiley face on it, you know, and you pull out your favorite undies, you know, that you've been wearing for 30 years, they're threadbare and the, the elastic is getting a little loose. And, and then you, you know, dig a little deeper and lo and behold, you got that bikini, you know, with the Valentine hearts on it. And don't tell me you guys don't have them because I know you do, you know. So I'm really going to bear my underwear drawer, although I'm still wearing my jeans right now. And I'm going to show you uh, how this thing is set up uh, and, and we'll start working through a series of questions about how, what's my style of photography. And these are the sorts of things that I hope you'll take back and, and work through uh, on your own as we go. So from now on, please uh, put anything in chat if you don't want to say something live. Otherwise, turn on your microphone and, and you know, say hi, raise the questions and, and, and see what's going on. And I'm going to challenge you right now to not only ask questions, but I want you, before we're done tonight, to find five problems that I have with my Lightroom catalog. I found about 10 uh, in the last couple of days as I was putting this together, and I found three more today. So find these problems and, and see how these problems show up and how you can fix them in your own catalog. It's really quite fascinating. So, Here's my basic Lightroom, and you know, I set up, and you notice there's nothing there, but if we go up to the left-hand corner up here, I can open up the catalog, and you can see that I'm going to be showing you data on about 135,000 images that I've, that I've stored in this catalog. And there are a bunch of other things up here that we'll come back to and look later. Now, here's the physical part of that organization structure that I told you about before. These are the file folders. And if you'll notice, I have three drives currently connected to my PC. I have my SSD drive where all the programs are running. That's where Lightroom is physically located and is running from this SSD drive. I've got an internal hard drive that I have documents and, and uh, some photos on, uh, but the majority of my photos you'll see are in this external hard drive that's called Photo Master. And when we did our best practices classes a couple of years ago, you know, we kept coming back and saying, you really do want to try to keep your images on an external hard drive. You know, you're going to be growing your catalog, it's going to be getting bigger. Uh, and if you keep these things on an internal drive, 
the, the speed that you, or the time you save, because it might be a tiny bit faster, just isn't worth it when you have to keep changing the drives over uh, as you get more and more images. And you'll see this drive is, I think this is an eight terabyte drive right now and my backups are eight terabyte. Uh, and they're starting to get to the point where I'm, I'm pushing 80% capacity, which means I'm gonna probably have to go to a larger size drive very shortly. So, so far, I'm not really showing you anything other than my drawer. I haven't opened it yet. So let's open the underwear drawer here. And the first thing you'll see is every image that I have is in a subfolder that's called pictures. And I really encourage people to do that for backup purposes. There's nothing better than having all of your images in one single folder. It will save you a massive amount of time because as you see, if I open pictures, all of a sudden I've got quite a few folders here. Now, I have chosen to organize my folders by date. You know, and uh, I got my serious uh, digital photography equipment in 2010. Uh, and so all of those images are up here. When I was shooting other digital images, they're sort of in a hodgepodge of files down here. Um, so that's my basic organization. And the first question that we're gonna to ask tonight about our photographic style is where do we shoot? And there are lots of ways to answer that question. But I'll show you what I have done. And I'm gonna pick a year that I happen to know is very interesting, 2011. This was the year that I retired. Uh, I took off uh, in an RV and left Florida and uh, traveled up the East Coast of the United States up to Newfoundland. And so I categorize all of my photos uh, by general location. It could be continent, country, probably by state. And you'll see here that these are all by state. Uh, and I've done this in, in, in an interesting way that, that may seem a little bit weird is that I have in this 2011 directory, I've categorized it by New Hampshire 2011. And I've done that because if I ever in the future want to reorganize and get rid of this stuff, I can no longer remember what year these things were taken. I would like to be able to pull all the New Hampshire pictures, all the main pictures, I'd like to put these together and so I've done this just sorting it by year. Now, certainly it's not necessary to do that kind of thing, but you get a pretty good idea of where photos were taken in that period of time. Now, we just mentioned that, that Lightroom has some powerful tools that help us look at very, very specific locations of where we shoot. If you have a GPS function in your camera, for example, you can get your picture identified within about 10 feet of where it was taken anywhere in the world. Uh, but you don't have to have a GPS enabled camera because your smartphone has a GPS and there's all kinds of very nice slick and free software programs that all you have to do is set the clock on your phone to match the time on your camera and you turn on your GPS and it will link to Lightroom and it will put the GPS coordinates from your phone at the time the image was taken uh, uh, by your camera. So you don't have to have that. Uh, and I have used both of these functions from time to time, but another function that I find very, very uh, nice about where I shoot is to go up and use the map function in Lightroom. And when you open the map, you get Google Maps pulled up. And where am I here? I'm up in, I'm up in Newfoundland already. And I can go back here and I can say, gee, I went from Miami, I know I went from Orlando to Newfoundland and it's gonna show me where I took those pictures. But there's no data. What in the world is going on? There's no data. I'm not seeing any of those pictures. Well, the reason you're not seeing any of those pictures is when I was back here, I set this up uh, in a manner that you're not seeing any pictures here because number one, I'm not showing you any 
of the subdirectory information. That's why when we went back here, you're seeing all zero images in each of these things. So before you try to find something in the map function or by location, you need to do two things. First thing you need to do is you need to go up. This is going to be interesting because I've got all this Zoom stuff in front of me, but you need to go up to your library and come down here and say, show photos in subdirectories. And that needs to be clicked on. Now look at how it's changed things. All of a sudden now I'm seeing the number of images that were shot in 2011 and in each of the subdirectories below that. Now, that's step one. Step two is if I want to know where all of these images were shot in this particular year, I need to select those images. And that's the keyboard shortcut uh, control or on a Mac, I think it's command A. And that just selected all the pictures that I have now in this folder. 2011. <clears throat> so now that all these are selected, I can go into my map, come down here, and zoom in, and lo and behold, here's where I took all these pictures. Every place I stopped, every day I shot, here is the approximate location of all of these things going up the East Coast, you know, getting up into New England, going across, you know, uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, taking the ferry across, getting up into Newfoundland. And here I are in Newfoundland. And if I wanted to go up to my wildest, most remote place and click right here, now my film strip at the bottom shows glacier land and uh, all of the effects of the uh, <laughs> glaciers breaking up and the, uh, the uh, ice in the Arctic breaking up. And this particular iceberg right here, and I'll open this thing up. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, I won't, I won't open up right now. This particular iceberg that is shown in this thing is an iceberg that was nine miles long, <laughs> broken off the uh, Arctic ice uh, shelf uh, a year before and floated down ran into the north coast of Newfoundland and was stuck there. So, so. Hey, Lauren. Question, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we had one person ask a question. Uh, this is why are no photos located on 2011 when there are 2379 photos in Eastern Canada? Gotcha. Let's go back to that again. And I'll go back up here. Uh, I want to go from the map function. I want to hit uh, keyboard shortcut G to the grid function now, so I can see the library over here. And what you see now is there are that many images. The key was this command that I showed you up here under the library tab, show photos in subdirectories. Okay, that's the number one mistake people make is that they don't have that clicked, uh, and it looks like there are no images in any of those master folders. And as soon as I'll, I'll unclick that again. So now you see all these zeros. I have zero pictures. You know, I had somebody call me in a panic last year. Uh, come up and say, all my photos are gone. Where are they? And that was the problem that, that, that this show folders in subdirectories was not clicked. As soon as I click that, now you see every one of them. And now all of a sudden the grid is, is lit up. Does that answer the question? So Randy, was that? <laughs> Was that your question? You may have to unmute yourself. So that's two ways that you can look at that. Where do I shoot issue? Uh, we can talk about when do I shoot, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna save that for a little bit later. And let's go to what do I shoot now. <clears throat> This library database function is, is very powerful because we can look in any one of these folders in any one of the years, we can look at all the photos, you know, everything ever shot, or I can select any groups of them. And I'm gonna take this, this cluster of images that go from 2011 when I retired 
up until last week. And I'm going to hold down the shift key and click. <clears throat> so now I have selected all of these folders and everything that we look at now will show information from those folders. So the question was, what do I shoot? Well, Let's look at this one picture that happened to be selected here. And you can see when I look at the key words, there were deer. Uh, these are exotic deer. I'll tell you why, because these are uh, deer from Africa, not from uh, North America. Uh, it was shot in Florida and it was shot on the thing called the West Orange Bike Trail. Uh, and it happens to say in here that it was shot in 2011. So this gives you an idea that if I'm going to search for deer in any of my keywords, I'm going to be able to find this, this particular image, you know, along with probably several thousand other images. So how can I look and, and what subjects have I taken as a photographer, knowing that I'm going to be meticulous, and I'm going to put my general subject name as a keyword. Well, the way to do that is to come over here to this right-hand panel, and here you see a function called Keyword List. This is a list of every keyword of every image in this cluster of images that I've selected. So I'm going to go ahead and, and flip this little spinner and turn that on. Now, boy, are you seeing my dirty underwear, not my dirty underwear, my clean underwear in my underwear drawer. But you're seeing how absolutely crazy this thing is. Look at all of these key words. And in fact, I might be, no, I can't from here. I will, I will show you in a way uh, that I can tell you exactly what these keywords are. But again, I have only asked for keywords for this one selected image in all these folders. So I want to look at the keywords that describe all of these things. And the way to do that, again, is to go back here and do uh, Commander Control A, which will select all of our images. And now that they're selected, what you're going to see as I come over here and scroll down this keyword list is that every image that's in here that is being used is going to have a little mark beside it. Oops, sorry about that. I'll just turn that off. And here's the little marks. So you can see the images I have taken in here include all these things. Well, that's a million images. So that really isn't very helpful unless I have to find a very particular uh, uh, image that was shot in that period of time. So let's pick one particular year. And I'll just go back to 2011. <clears throat> I've got all of those images selected from 2011. And now we can go over here and now you can see what has been shot that year. I shot a picture of a crocodile. I've got something called crossing, a cruise ship, a dandelion, uh, a place called Darien, a town in Georgia. Uh, I've got some depth of field images in here. I shot a dock, a door, you know, I shot some sand dunes. So my images now, uh, are, are shown by the folder that I selected, the images that I selected within that folder, and then what's here. But still, what am I really shooting? Well, if you look at the functions on this keyword list, you go down here under dunes. I don't know if that's going to be the best one that I should pick up. Let's, let's see if I can find something. Uh, a little bit more specific than that. What would be a good thing here? Well, let's say full moon, okay? Everybody knows what that's gonna look like, not gonna be any great pictures. But I have 61 shots of something called full moon. And if you see, if I hover over that, the little arrow comes on, you click the arrow and bam, Every picture that I've taken that has a full moon during that year is pulled up immediately. So that answers the second question. Now we know where, uh, we know what images are taken. You know, uh, I had a question 
down myself and, and saying, you know, something that comes up to me very uh, fairly frequently is, what have I shot? I'm going to turn this off for a second. What have I shot and posted on social media? So let's go back and we're going to select all these years again over here. Let's shift, click. Okay, here's our images. I'm going to go Control or Command A again to pull up all of them. And I'm going to go up now and I am going to use the database functions that are in the grid mode up here that are called attributes. And if I open attributes, you see that I can pull up those pick flags, whether there's a rejection or whether there is a pick selected. I can look to see has an image uh, been edited or not edited. I can look at the star rating of images. I can look at the color of the images if I've color coded them. Uh, I can look and see are these images the primary image, are they virtual copies or are they videos? Okay, so I can select any of those things. And I told you already that I'm, I'm looking to say, what have I posted on social media? And I said that I flag all of my social media posts with blue. So by clicking that blue flag, all of a sudden, boom, and you can see down here of the 117,000 pictures, I've posted 1,700 of these one way or another uh, on social media. Um, and every one of those things are pulled up. So I instantly know, and somebody comes back and says, geez, did, you know, once upon a time you posted a picture of flamingos on social media, bam, I've got that thing nailed in one second. And so yeah, it's this image right here. You wanna buy one, <laughs> you know? So that's how fast that can be. So now we've done the where, we've done the what, we said, how about social media? Uh, and how about, if we want to know about quality of our image. So I'm gonna go back up here to this database function. I'm gonna hit none. So it's gonna delete anything that I've set right now in the flags. Uh, and I'm gonna go up here now and in all these years and all those pictures, I can go up under attribute and I can say, how many of my pictures were five stars? <laughs> Nothing. National Geographic was bad to me. How many were four stars? You know, that very unique, unusual picture that, you know, you can't find anyplace else. None. How many were three stars in that period of time? I don't know why these got three stars, but these were, uh, what were these? I'm not even sure. I think these were images that were, yeah, these were images that were purchased by a client. But two stars, boom, now we can go down and lo and behold, uh, in this period of time, there are 164 pictures that were selected as you know, having that two star characteristic or something special that I saw in that picture that I, that I liked and they're all pulled up instantly. If we go back down to one star, now there's gonna be a larger number and now you can see it is again about that that 10% that I told you about 1,500 of the, of the 100 and some thousand uh, pictures that happen to be in here. So I can look at them by quality. I can look at it by, how about pick flags? If I turn off that one star, I have to set that for none. Again, turn that back off. And I go back up here and said, do I have any pick flags activated in these images? For example, there it is, okay? I picked that image to do some editing. I said, I only use these pick flags, uh, you know, for temporary use. So here I've already found something uh, in my database structure that's wrong, okay? This shouldn't have a pick flag on it, you know? I'm finished with that, that, that golden eagle has been edited. Now, and I don't have to worry about that. So I can take this image select it, I can hit the keyboard shortcut U to unpick it, and lo and behold, I just fixed up my catalog, and got rid of that picked flag, uh, picked image because it doesn't belong there anymore. So again, any questions right here? So 
So that's quality of the images. Now let's take it into the step that I, I think everybody is, is really wanting to hear about tonight. And that is, how do I take pictures? What am I doing? How am I doing it? What gear am I using? And that comes under the metadata tab. So I'm gonna start out again. I'm gonna select none here to clear all those registers out. And now I'm going to come up and I'm going to say, metadata. Oops, and I didn't want all this stuff to come up. I was going to hide all this from you, but this did this automatically. So let me, let me, uh, let me get rid of this stuff here just a little bit. And I'll show you how we can, uh, how we can develop this. I'm just removing these columns right now. And I am going to change this column to my camera. And I'm going to have this column lens. And lo and behold, over this period of time, I have had shots that I have put in to Lightroom using all of these types of cameras here. And if I look at these carefully, uh, you can see here's a, a full frame Canon. Here's a crop sensor Canon. Uh, here is a very old Sony uh, 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 mirrorless camera. Uh, here is my Sony uh, A7R2 uh, uh, high resolution. That's the 42 megapixel mirrorless camera. Here's my uh, Sony uh, yeah, A7R Mark IV. This is a camera that I tried out. I didn't like it. Got rid of it. Uh, and here's my latest uh, offering, the Sony. Uh, A9 Mark II, which is my wildlife photography camera. And you can see exactly how many pictures that I've taken with each of those cameras. Now, so you think about that. The next question most people would say is, well, <clears throat> what lenses are you using? Well, I pulled up on the second column. This is every lens that I have. I'm going to get rid of this one camera here. And way I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to I'm going to select all of these and then I'm going to go back. This is a I know is a phone. This is a phone and this is that older digital camera now. So now I and in fact I'm going to get rid of this one because I, I didn't buy it. So so these are the four cameras that I've primarily used for the last uh, several years. <laughs> now with those cameras now I can go over here and look at lenses. And I can say, how many shots did I take in this time period over here with these cameras here? And here are all the lenses that I've used. Now, how is this useful? Well, let's, let's pick one camera. Let's say we're going to look at a full frame DSLR, sort of a classic camera like, like most of you will be using at one time or another. But these are the lenses that I have used on that particular camera. And you can see uh, right away, I love the 24 to 70, 2.8, 19,000 shots of the 36,000 in here were shot with that particular lens. And I obviously love the, the big baby here, the 600 F4. And it even tells me that I shot more with the 1.4 extender than I did just with the 600 F4 by itself. <clears throat> so lots of pieces of information. Uh, how often did I use my 100 to 400 kind of go-to uh, wildlife camera with a 1.4 extender? Took five shots. How about with this camera? If I go back and look at my crop sensor camera, ooh, look at that, 100 to 400 35,000 shots, okay? So you can tell what camera am I using, what lens am I using uh, on that camera, how many pictures am I taking uh, with each of those? Uh, are there any lenses that I really don't use and don't need? Or what if we take it a step further and we add another column of metadata over here and I go back to, to this area here and I say add a column and this time the column that I want to add is what focal length am I shooting at with all those zoom lenses 
And it, I think this is, is really fascinating. Now let's just look at the two uh, Canon cameras right here. Now the two standard DSLR cameras, these are the lenses that, that uh, I've used on those. And let's pick one of the zooms. <laughs> let's say the 24 to 70. It's probably a, a lens that most of you have uh, something that's, that's shooting in that range. It's one of those popular lenses ever made. And how do I use that 24 to 70 lens? Well, I took 28,000 shots. Over 9,000 were shot at 24 millimeters. I start looking through this thing and it's a few hundred, but nothing even hits a thousand until you get 70 millimeters and there's another 7,000 right there. So I'm using this zoom lens that has all this infinite number of focal lengths, either zoomed all the way in or zoomed all the way out. Okay. Could I get by with two prime lenses maybe? I don't know. Let's look at another lens that, <clears throat> that is uh, popular and a, and a fun sort of lens here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Let's look at the 100 to 400. Because this, for all you people that get the gear acquisition syndrome from time to time, this is what you really need to do. Because when I look at how I have used that 100 to 400 millimeter lens with the 36,000 shots, almost 5,000 were at 100 millimeters. <coughs> and again, sort of scattering numbers of shots along the way. <clears throat> until I get to 400 millimeters, there are almost 14,000 images that were shot. So what's that tell me? Well, that tells me I need to call Nancy and say, you know, I probably could use a new $10,000 400 millimeter F2.8 lens, right? Because that's where I'm shooting this thing, whatever. Okay, really telling you about how you're using the equipment which cameras you're using, what lenses you're using, and how you're using that particular lens. <clears throat> Questions about that? Okay, let's go one step further now. And, and instead of saying, what equipment am I using? Let's look and think about how am I using that equipment? So let's add a couple more columns of, of data over here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna come up here, whoops. Don't ever do that, don't lock that thing. If you lock that thing, it will do bad things. Um, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna try to hit that magic spot. Someplace up here without locking that. <laughs> Tell you what, let me start over again, I'm going to reject that data and I'm going to come back and look at metadata <clears throat> but I want to open up another column that's what I was trying to do down here so I'm going to add a column this time we're going to talk about how do I take pictures and so what I'm going to look at is some of the things that affect <clears throat> uh, my exposure okay so I'm going to look first at what apertures do I shoot at and then I'm going to come up here and I'm gonna add another column and I'm gonna say, <clears throat> what shutter speeds am I using? I can pull up shutter speeds. And then finally, the third element of our exposure triangle, I'm gonna come down here and add and say, what ISO settings am I using? <clears throat> and now you can really, really start telling something about how many times do I do something really stupid when I'm shooting shooting pictures. And then right now, I'm just going to look at these two Canon cameras. Uh, I'm not, I'm going to look at all of the lenses that I've used on that. I'm going to look at all focal lengths. And I'm just going to say, what apertures did I happen to shoot? Well, you can see it goes all the way from F2.8, lots up to F5.6. Not a whole lot in the middle, although there are some. And then there's a big cluster here that, that's a little bit tighter. Well, that doesn't tell me very much. What would tell me more is if I pick a particular lens and say, you know, with this lens, 
what kind of apertures am I using? Because I'm using lenses according to the style of photography. Obviously, I'm using wide angle lens for, for landscape stuff. I'm going to use a telephoto lens more for, for wildlife. So let's go back to that good old 24 to 70 and see how I shot with that particular lens. And I'm not even going to look at focal length. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to take focal length. I'm just going to get that out of there so we have less things to look at here. So what apertures did I use in these two cameras on that? And again, here's a bunch of stuff that I shot wide open. And it goes down here, all the way down to you know, F22. I've got it close. I don't know where this came from, F23. I don't think I, don't think I picked those up for F22 is the smallest uh, aperture on that. But I can get an idea of what I, what I was shooting at. So let's take one of these particular apertures, f2.8, how in the world did I have the camera set if I was shooting wide open? And look at this. Look at these exposures. 44 seconds, 30 seconds, 25 seconds. Very, very, very long exposures on these. Now, is anybody willing to bet that these are pictures of waterfalls? Oh, or night sky. These are all night pictures. These are all pictures at the barn. I did not light paint the barn. Actually, there were no rules about light painting the barn when these images were taken. You can't do that anymore, so don't, don't do that. So these happen to be night uh, pictures that were shot 25 seconds with the thing, uh, with the lens wide open. Uh, if we go down into more traditional, you know, shutter speeds, you say, I don't, I don't shoot a lot of real, real, fast shutter speeds, you know, when I'm shooting an f2.8. What about if we go to all aperture? What kind of thing am I doing now? Okay, well now it's all over the place, okay? But in general, it looks like I'm clustering most of my shots on this 24 to 70 millimeter lens somewhere, you know, between about a 50th of a second and about a 500th of a second. They seem to be clustered in there. So again, it kind of gives you an idea how I'm shooting, you know, am I doing things that are uh, unreasonable, you know, in any regard. Uh, if we jump over one more column now on this lens and say, what kind of ISOs am I shooting at? Well, the native ISO for this particular, at least both these cameras is 100. And so you can see the, the vast majority of shots were shot at ISO 100 but sometimes 200 and actually had to kick it up to fairly high levels sometime. Well, that's where the wide angle is. What about if we're shooting wildlife? Okay, what if I'm down here shooting with this uh, 100 to 400 millimeter lens uh, with the one point, oops, with the 1.4 uh, extender on it? <laughs> You know, what kind of apertures am I using? Well, you can see I'm using this thing basically wide open most of the time, rarely going, uh, you know, to uh, the very, very small apertures. Uh, there are some weird shots in here. I mean, I can't imagine a telephoto lens shooting something uh, at a 13th of a second. So I have to look at that just to see what in the world was that. That was a night shot. Uh, palm tree someplace in the desert in Southern California, I think. Uh, but you look at most of these shots with this 100 to 400, you know, shooting wildlife primarily, you know, probably starts around this, this you know, 160th of a second up into the thousandth or two thousandth of a second. I mean, that's kind of where you think you really want to try to capture wildlife. Uh, it just gives you an idea of uh, you know, of, of uh, how you're shooting. So <clears throat> ISOs, when I'm shooting wildlife on this, uh, is this, this, I learned a lot about my photography, probably more from this than anything I've learned uh, since I've been out in Jackson. I used to think, oh man, I don't want digital noise. I'm gonna shoot at ISO 100 if it kills me, you know? And finally, I realized, hey, I'm not here at dawn, usually pre-dawn to shoot these, these animals. You know, if I'm shooting an ISO 100, I'm shooting a 60th of a second with a 400 millimeter lens. That, that just doesn't work. I'm not getting anything sharp. So maybe 200 is better. And then I learned later, hey, maybe 400 is better. 
And then I finally learned that, hey, if I'm going to start shooting in the morning, when it's light enough for me to see the animal, I'm going to start at ISO 800. And when I can really see, I'm going to go to ISO 400. And that's going to allow me, we'll see if it's true, now at ISO 800, let's see what kind of shutter speeds I was able to shoot at. Lo and behold, 400 millimeter lens shooting pretty much around a 400th of a second using that rule of reciprocity of one over the focal length as being the, uh, the, the shutter speed that is the, the uh, longest that you can use. And this is a, a lens that actually has internal stabilization also. So you probably can get about one stop more on that. So kind of get an idea of what you're shooting, how you're shooting, uh, what sort of things you're, you're uh, doing when it's, when it's crazy and when it's not crazy. Uh, so let's open things up for questions a little bit here and just see, are there any things you would like to see since the underwear drawer is open right now? Can I, can I show you something about my photography? You, got, you guys got to find five errors. And so far, the only thing I've popped up with is I had one thing I had a pick flag that shouldn't have. So Lauren, I'll, I'll ask you a loaded question because <laughs> this came up once when I, I posted something on the uh, Thursday photo topics. So find me all your pictures that, that have blue in them. I'm sorry, that have what? Have blue in them. Blue, that's a hard one. I don't, <laughs> I don't code for that. And that I don't, well, I, I remember I said when that. You did, when you yeah. did spirals, I don't code for spiral. But, uh, <laughs> Like when you said shadows, you know, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, boom, I could pull up shadows in two seconds. Well, and, and I just did that because you had yeah. told me that uh, when I asked for a color one time, that you had never done that. <laughs> so, yeah. Again, it, it's showing you the power that if you use a lot of keywords, you really can do it. And if, if, you're, if you're thinking, if, if you're a fine art photographer, and you're going to put yourself through those kind of exercises, maybe that's worth doing and saying, hey, I'm going to color code these things. I'm going to do shape. Uh, one, one that I do uh, that, that sounds like the kind of stuff that you're talking about sometimes. Let me, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to clear this and get rid of that for a second. One of the things that I do is textures. I'm, I'm always fascinated by textures. So, if I go up here and just pull up this thing <clears throat> in textures, uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, that pops into my mind. I'm going to squeeze that up here just a little bit so you can see a few more of these. But these are the kind of things that pop into my mind when I start thinking about seeing textures. You know, it's sand dunes, it's rock formations, and, you know, it's all these things. I, I can't embarrass myself by trying to say what kind of rock this is because. John's on. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm taking pictures of, but but these are things that caught my eye as, as textures. There's some ice textures and all that, but I, I must admit I did do blue. Yeah, Randy. Hey, Lauren. Oh, Mike, yeah. Lauren. Mute it. Yeah. Lauren. Oh, Rick. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. You, you, you uh, on your folders panel there, you uh, yeah. opened up 2011, uh -huh. and basically you had them. The uh, the main the subfolders under there were were uh, location based. Yes, I assume that's what you do, like 2012, 13, 14, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. As well. Let me open up. Uh, okay. Now, not, now, not, I, I'd assume that's what you're doing. Yeah. So the question becomes, how do you? I, I assume you. In each of these years, you shoot in the same locations from time to time. Yeah. So in your uh, keywording, et cetera, system, how do you find, uh, say, all the all the photos? I look at Idaho there. How do you find all the photos you've ever taken of Idaho? OK, good, great question. Um, the easiest thing, since I code Idaho uh, as a key word, because that, that's my primary location thing. Uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm looking, I always have a state or if I'm traveling country in here. So if I can figure out how you spell Idaho, 
you can see I can come down here and on one click, everything in Idaho. Okay. Now the, the question becomes then, if you go to the trouble of keywording there, why do you why do you uh, make your folder name include Idaho? Good, good question. I, I definitely would not have to. Absolutely would not have to. But you know where it helps me, Rick, tremendously is sometimes I'll come back over here and I'll say, hmm, let's look at Idaho. Okay, here's every Idaho image. Now let's go back and now I'm going to get away from the keyword list and I'm going to look at the actual keywords. So I'm going to select all the images with a control command A. And here, lo and behold, here is every keyword on these 517 images that were shot. So let's see, were they all Idaho? Yep, look at that, Idaho, and there's no asterisk behind it, meaning that that keyword is used on every image that I selected. The other words you see there, there are, you know, I shot a lily pond, I shot a fire hydrant, I shot a ghost town. Uh, all of those have an asterisk because there's only some images that have that. So I clean up my database on a regular basis and go back and say, hey, did I really put Idaho on every one of these images that happen to be in Idaho? That's just one way you can do it. Uh, okay. Is it necessary? Absolutely not. You, you don't need that at all. Um, okay. Uh, another question. Let's look at your keyword list panel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I tend to use, uh, you, you basically have a flat list there as opposed to hierarchical list. Uh, the, the problem with that and why I've gone to hierarchical list is, is basically uh, what you're doing right now. Yep. You've got to scroll yep. so much. So what you're doing Typically is what, what I this. have, what I have, my main categories in my keyword list and I don't, the keywording panel, I, I hate it. I don't, it's, it's not even in my system. But anyway, uh, it's location. And then I have, you know, under that, you know, national parks, national monuments, et cetera, states, and, and then keywords associated with uh, below those. And then also have, have subjects type thing, just for, because mm -hmm. of some things are, uh, I need subject information, that sort of thing. So it's much easier to navigate than a, than a flat panel. Why have you stayed with the flat panel rather than trying to combine some of the stuff into a hierarchical. Well, that's what you can see here, like bird, for example. That's yeah. what I've done because it was just getting yeah. ridiculous. I had so yeah. many, look at how many kinds of birds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I started doing, I've done the same thing you know, with, with okay. ungulates yeah. and some well, of the mammals and all that kind of stuff. And you're absolutely right. It really I, helps. because the, the nice thing to share with people, if, if you haven't used the, the keywording function much and that sort of thing, is you can reorganize not very easily here without having to start from scratch again. Yep. You can drag and drop and create a uh, collection or uh, keyword sets and, and things of that nature and then move stuff underneath there. So you, you can, if you don't like one way, like a, 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 a flat thing and you want to go hard article, it's fairly simple to be able to do that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, Oh, and and you can see some of the things it, it does here. You can see I have keyword sets too. And you know, there's outdoor photography, portrait, you know, a bu bunch of things like this have sets of keywords. And you can edit these sets, you can rename them, you can add to them, uh, and you can create the hierarchical uh, yeah, structure, which I think is a, is a very, very good way to go. I, I wish yeah, I would have done that at the beginning. Because there's so few spaces there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, underneath <laughs> that, where it says keyword set, that you've only got nine, yeah. and, and that mm -hmm. is rel relatively useless for me. Yeah. So, yeah. That so that's why I don't use that panel. Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to shut up. Oh, okay. no, I was no, just no, going to show good. how you can do a nested or a hierarchical keyword. <clears throat> you can. Uh... Keywords containing keywords. Um, let me just see how I have keyword this. list. Yeah, have this thing set up here. Keyword list. Yes. Yeah. Wow. We'll just find something like, like say, Addis. You know, I can select by right clicking and go over, and I can do a keyword tag. Uh, I can uh, 
put new keywords inside of this keyword. In other words, it's, it's almost exactly the same as your structure over here for folders. And just, it's just a matter of right click, uh, you know, and, and doing what you, what you want to do. An easier way would be go to the top of that panel and, and yeah. hit the plus sign and then add a keyword set. Uh, yeah. hit, hit the plus sign there. Plus. plus. Up here. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and you want to uh, add a. Uh, this is another powerful function, too, that, that we didn't yeah. talk about. You, could, you, you can, can use that, Yeah. So you can uh, add that and then you drag stuff into the, what, yeah. whatever you create here. Yeah. And it, it's really nice because sometimes I forget, like, uh, drives me nuts. I'll have like flower and flowers. Ah, okay, is one really single or not? Tree or trees or leaf or leaves, you know, that kind of stuff. So you can put all the synonyms in that you want, and it will automatically code for either word. So if you go up and you pull up, I want to see trees, boom, you got all your trees. What about misspelling? Oh, thank you. I am a horrible typist, and I misspell probably one word, and the faster I do it, the, you know, trying to put stuff in, the more likely I am to misspell stuff. This is what I unfortunately corrected so many of the other day, uh, but you can look through here and let, let's see, somebody sees something that's misspelled. I don't happen to see it now, but what, what, is, what is so neat uh, about how this thing is set up. Say, let's say, uh, look at dough. Okay, I don't know what's going to come up on this, but when I said dough, for some reason, some of these ungulates, I, I coded. I don't know why these came up because there's something else, but that might be an error too. We could look at it. Oh, I know why. Um, <clears throat> But say I, I misspelled this thing and I and I wrote it D-E-O. Okay, well, nothing would show up under Doe, but I would still see that D-E-O term up here. So what you do is you open that up, you pull it up, uh, you look at everything that has D-E-O instead of D-O-E, you go up to the to your actual keywords again. Now you have all the images up here, you select them all. In this, in this group, again, with the command A, okay? And you go up here and you say, oh, okay, there was DO here and it was DEO. You change it, you spell it correctly. You say yes to this and put the, that you've got that. And every one of those images that came up under DEO now vanish and now they're all automatically under DOE. So you can correct the spelling very, very easily. Uh, but it, as Rick pointed out, it gets hard. I mean, I think there are, uh, in fact, we'll find out. Let's, uh, since, since this thing happened to default to this, there are 3,072 different keywords, okay? Well, that does make it complicated. And by doing the nesting and the hierarchical uh, structure, it really does help you get to where you want to be much more quickly. And, uh, thanks a lot, Rick. That's an excellent suggestion. And again, you, you see that there are three or four different workflows and how you can do that, you know, uh, by using this function, you know, by adding to the keyword list, by typing into a keyword up here, by right clicking down here. And there are always at least three ways to do just about everything you want to do in these various database tools. Lauren, do you use smart collections? Yes, thank you. Who asked that? Uh, the, the, oh. the, the question, uh, if saying you do that, question becomes uh, when you scroll on down to your keyword list there, uh, you, when you have uh, a, a keyword, you'll have, you'll have some spaces in there. Yeah. That can cause you some problems when you set up a smart collection thing. You're absolutely how do you, How do you handle that? <laughs> Well, let's let's look at the at the smart collection one. That was the last thing on my list here that I that I had. And this I'm sorry, I didn't mean didn't no, mean to jump ahead. No, it was the perfect second. Okay. Okay. Uh, we haven't talked about collections yet in Lightroom. And the collections in Lightroom are all virtual. 
So anything that goes into these collections takes virtually zero disk space. And if we look through this thing, you can do collection sets, okay? Like for example, here I have a collection set, a little file box here that is called calendars. And lo and behold, it's a 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. So all of my calendars are in there because they are relatively straightforward. There are gonna be 13 images every year, a cover and 12 monthly pictures. And they're going to be in there and they're not going to change. So they go into these standard types of collections up here. Okay. And as we go down now, we get away from the collection sets for a minute and drop down here. You can see now I have some collections that are also uh, static that I did uh, some small prints. I did what's this, a Sony presentation. Uh, uh, this is a slide set for a show about South Africa. Uh, so these are standard, they don't change, they're always the same. But what Rick was talking about is the single most powerful way to understand your photography, and that is through what is called smart collections. And you see there's a collection set that comes in Lightroom, you all have it, this was built into the program, and it's called smart collections. So if I open the spinner, all of a sudden now, Here's a whole bunch of smart collections. And Lightroom comes pre-installed that it will pick out images that have one star, two stars, three, four, five. It'll go back, it'll cover, uh, I'm just gonna laugh about uh, what, what David had asked about because I think it says color this, color that. Um, so I don't see that right now. Uh, I don't see that right now. Um, but what smart collections allow you to do is to set a list of criteria that you want to see and you never want to maintain it again. And I'll just give you one example uh, here that is, uh, how about bears, okay? If I take a picture of a bear and and that's where the smart collection comes in. And I have given it one star or greater, meaning that I think it's a decent shot for whatever reason. Every single time I put a new picture in, it automatically goes in the collection. I don't do anything. It is automatic. Okay. So how do we set these criteria up? So we're going to go up here and we're going to, to you're going to tell me what you want to see of my images. So we're going to go up here to the collection spinner on top. We're going to say plus means add a new collection. And the first thing it says, you want to just create a collection. You want a smart collection. You want a collection set. You know, what do you want? Well, we're going to do a smart collection. And boom, all of a sudden, we get a table of Boolean logic laid out before us. And we're going to call this thing... Uh, about just TPC ed class. Now, what do you want to see in a collection of images? You tell me and I'll see if Lightroom knows how to do it. Anybody? No, I don't make it easy. At least to have one star. Okay, so it's gotta have one star. So that actually turns out to be the default first Boolean principle that comes up. And you can say is greater than or equal to one star, is one star, is not one star, is less than one star, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, or it's in a range between one star and four stars. How about sunrises? Okay, good one. So how are we gonna do that? Now we've got, it's gotta be a one star. So let's say we wanna to add to that. And this time we don't wanna add another rating but we would like to add what? We would like to go down here. And we other would metadata. like other to metadata. find, pardon? Other metadata. Yeah, we'd like to go down here and look through all of these different kinds of things that can be set up. But when we get down finally to other metadata, one of the things we can do is say a keyword. So we have a keyword and it can contain the word, contain everything we put in, contain any of the things we put in or doesn't contain what we put in, starts with, ends with, 
you know, and it's got some other functions on here. So you said sunset, sunrise. Either one. This is based one. on where you live, but I said sunrise is based on where you live. Okay. But... okay. So now, anything else you want to know? Uh, how about? Okay. Taking how with about, a wide angle. How about length? fall or uh, summer uh, or even fall? Okay. Very good. So we can come down here and we can go back then and we can look at a keyword. And we're going to say the keyword that we want is fall. Okay. Can we make it any harder on you? <laughs> make it a wide angle lens. Okay. <laughs> No problem. So we go down here now. Come down. We're going to say our metadata. Any searchable metadata. Let me find out. Not exactly. I haven't done this one before, but we can do under camera information. Lens. 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 Yeah. I'd like to. Let's just say. No, I'm not sure. I've never done this before. Let me just see. You'd have to give the description of the, the lens, yeah. I think. I'm just trying to figure I, out if I can, can do it greater than or less than. I don't, I'm not sure yes. if this will work. Uh, let me just let me just put something. I don't, I don't know for sure if this will work. I've never done this kind of search before. So let's just take a peek and just see if something comes up with that. Okay, we got nothing that meets that criteria. I, that, think you, I think you have to put the word can in there or whatever. Yeah, I, th I think I have, to give, yeah, I have to give an exact name. So, so yeah. let's just, let's get rid of that one and just see if we can find these things. I know we can find this, we can find it certainly the other way, but let's just see now with that, if we save this thing, oh, look at that. Fall sunrises, there they are. Maybe in Africa. They all have a star. Yeah, pretty, pretty damn space. cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, so again, your style of photography, you just want to say, geez, am, am I doing a good job with sunrise photography? You can pull up your sunrise pictures. You can look at them and say, gee, there's, I, I like something about this one. I, I don't like something about the other. Again, using the database function to learn about your photography by seeing exactly what you're doing. And, and, I'm not sure what the limit is on, on the, uh, the smart collection uh, function. I, I know you can use at least nine levels of logic to select those images. You can get very, very specific uh, and do all sorts of interesting stuff. That way. The, the interesting part about this is, is if, if you say you have new photos that you've taken and you keyword and, and it, the keywording of those new photos Reese's criteria, say one photo, this all of a sudden will go up to 11. Yep. You don't have to do anything else except keyword. That's the, the most. If you, if you delete, change the keyword on one of these photos that doesn't meet the criteria, it would go down to nine. Yep. yep. The analogy I like to use for smart collections, if you've ever used a spreadsheet and created formulas in a spreadsheet that depend on other location cells in the spreadsheet, that's a smart collection. Yeah. That's exactly what a smart collection is. It's it's the most powerful of all these types of search functions. Yeah. And the thing I like about it is like I said, I can I can set up my favorite subject like like say a bear and and anytime I enter and you know and it doesn't care if it's a black bear, a grizzly bear, you know, uh, uh, you know, cinnamon bear. I mean, I, I could put in any kind of thing. If the word bear is in there and it has one star, it's going to pull up in that thing. And when somebody calls me and says, geez, I need a bear picture, uh, boom. If I need a bear picture in the snow, boom, I can get it. Now, Randy. One of the things that I found that to be very valuable for is I have one that's uh, photo prints. And sometimes I'm wondering, did I ever send this out to get a print, but I've got this photo, that that smart collection that I can go back and look, oh yeah, and I know the date yep. and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah. That really solves some problems for me. I mean, that probably can be used in the same way for other things. Yep. 
Absolutely. So, Lauren, um, I guess the question is then, where's the discipline button that shocks you to do it? Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a story. I mean, since, since my underwear drawer is open, what got me into this? Uh, two weeks ago, I was reviewing this. And I, was, I was correcting misspelled keywords. That's actually what I was doing. I was going through and look at all the stuff that was misspelled. I couldn't find some images. And I, I decided to look at all this in Lightroom. I saved my Lightroom collection. And then I went into File Manager and opened up these folders. I found 10,000 images that were duplicates. 10,000, over a half a terabyte of duplicate images that were not in Lightroom, but they were things that I did because I lacked discipline and it had to do with how I imported. And I, I, everyone here has heard me say, you have one catalog and only one catalog, except me. Uh, I have a travel catalog <laughs> on my laptop that I export the entire catalog normally into my master catalog that's on the PC. I did it wrong. And all of a sudden I had literally thousands of duplicate images that were taking up massive amount of disk space and I'm sure slowing things down. And I was able to use Lightroom, go through, check the are they all there? Yep, they're there, delete, you know, and they're now 10,000 images sitting in my recycle bin uh, that, that I've been able to clean that up on. So the discipline is the key thing. Uh, I, I mentioned at the very beginning, I said I'd come back to it. I, I do on my import workflow, I rename my images always. And I do two things on the renaming structure. The first thing I do is I name the general location. And most often around here, it's Van Tuchel National Park or National Elk Refuge or something like that. But I keep the number assigned by the camera always because if I have to go back and search and find a particular image that, that perhaps has been renamed or whatever, I can go back to that, that fairly small number of images that have a common number and I can search and find those. So I leave that. So I do that on import. The second thing I do on import before I push the import button, I put in all the keywords that I can uh, can think of. And, and let's let's be real about this and and uh, go back up here because I've only shot ten pictures this year, and I was out snowshoeing the other day, and so <clears throat> I said I was in the Grovon campground. I was snowshoeing. It was winter in Wyoming. I put those keywords in, they applied to all 10 images. So those were my core keywords. Now, what I'll go back and do is, is someplace along the line, and maybe I did. Yes, I did. I said, oh, Nancy, 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 Nancy. So Nancy was in some of these pictures. So I added that in there. So when, when she said, oh, you never take a picture of me, I can pull up the 3,000 pictures I have. Mostly embarrassing to Nancy uh, as we were snowshoeing. Um, so those are the core keywords. And then when I hit the import button and I've applied an import preset, but I also use it does about 80% of my processing uh, before I ever see the images with that import preset. Uh, then I go get a cup of coffee or make a pot of coffee. And while it's doing all those things and creating the, uh, the previews and when it's you know, changing all the raw images to uh, digital negatives, um, you know, I can be doing something else. When I come back, 80% of my work is done with one click of the button. And then I just have to add a few more keywords and then start doing the editing on the images that I think are useful. So, other thoughts or questions? Uh, what, one other thing that you can do with smart collections, I don't know if you want to touch on this or not but you can actually create some smart collections that will help you in your workflow as well. For instance, if uh, you know, you, one of your, your steps in, in uh, doing it is keywords. So if you bring an, an import in and you, and you forget to keyword certain photos, you could have a smart collection that said, hey, what photos don't have a keyword yep. uh, type mm -hmm. thing or a, 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 a pick flag. Or, or whatever, what are your, the, the flag things, or a star rating, yep. or a, a, col a, 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 a color color thing, and that sort of thing. So you can util utilize that to help you so you don't forget some things. 
yeah. and that sort of thing. Good idea. Excellent. And, and those are actually, those functions are built in. You can pull up, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed when we were back here looking at attributes, uh, images that have been edited or not been edited. You can pull yeah. them all up yeah. right here, yeah. a simple yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the, then the, one of the, the things is the, no keywords. The, uh, the, pro the problem with that particular criterion is if you do one thing to it, yeah. hit one slider, it yeah. says it's edited, but it's yeah. not really edited. You're, you, nobody does just one slider and, and they're finished editing a photo. That's right. So. And I do presets. And so if you've done a preset, that's on the yeah. tool. Yeah. yeah. Unless instead of a preset, that you've done over here, if you've done it over, you know, on, on this side, and, you know, in the develop module and pulled up this, this formatting stuff that you can do now, that, that's another class, but you can do it yeah. that way, which keeps all the sliders in the middle. So it shows that yeah. you no know, yeah. pieces. Yeah. 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 Other questions? What I, I really hope everybody will do now is, is go into Lightroom. You know, and just select all of your photos, you know, go up here. Back to the starter. Go up here to the very top and hit, just hit this all photographs button up here. So everything you've ever shot is available. And then just start playing with these things. You know, look at the, the searching of text. You can search text. You can look for uh, file names. You can look for copy names. If you title or put captions on your images, you can look for keywords. You can pull up that searchable metadata function. Uh, you know, you can go into attributes and look up, you know, what has been picked, not been picked, quality, um, you know, color coding that you've done. And then the powerful one is looking at the metadata where you can basically pull up anything you can think of about your images. You can look at your style. You can, you can go over here. And, and one thing I encourage people to do from time to time uh, the reason mine was was configured this way initially is go back here and go back into that library function and turn off the subfolders thing. And if you go down here and say, oh crap, what's this? I've got something sitting in the folder 2017 that has not been tagged to a location. And trust me, I found hundreds of images the other day that were just sitting here in the year folder. And what is that? Oh, it's a picture of a my uh, registration for my RV or my car or something like that. I didn't, I didn't flag that and put it someplace. So you can use these functions to clean up, you know, your database um, and uh, really get it very, very functional, very, very useful, and very, very convenient. So now I promised we would end at 7.30 p.m. and we've already gone over. Uh, a rhetorical or philosophical question? I'll, I'll use your, your particular example here, but I think we all probably have this. Why does anybody need 130,000 photos in their catalog? <laughs> you know why? Because memory is cheaper than my time to delete all these things. You know? Yeah, I, but I you get, some you get, 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 get confused too. <laughs> you get confused. I, I, Personally, my philosophy is I don't want any more than 30,000. I'd like to have less than 30,000. I've probably shot a hundred and some odd thousand in my life, but I've got only got 30. If you look at my catalog, it's a little less than 30,000 because I've been going through and, and getting rid of stuff. So that's fantastic. I, I wish I had not, the not because that. not because I want to save hard drive space. It just it's just too much stuff. So, yeah. so as I say, it's a rhetorical question, a philosophical question, but uh, and I saw everybody kind of smile and laugh. So everybody, I think probably everybody has the same issue. But yeah, so, imagine if you had tried to do this with film. Yeah, yeah. The, the only the only uh, answer I've come up with is 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 a, is L A Z Y. Yeah. Probably we're just too lazy to yeah. to take the time and the effort. You know. Well, that's why I use that simple star function. That that in fact. The only thing you'll like this, Rick, the only thing that I have backed up on the cloud are the ones that have one star or more. So in other words, if I lost my hard drive here, my backup hard drive there, my backup hard drive that's in the safe deposit box, the only images I would have them would be that uh, probably about whatever they were, one star. You know. 
So real quickly, I know this was kind of a test run as could we do a class on Zoom? And again, this one's more of a, uh, uh, well, let's get feedback from everybody else here before I start <laughs> making comments. I mean, this, we, this... y'all think we could run a, a Zoom class uh, in the future? I, th yeah. I think this was very valuable. Um, and especially if we have it as a video that's on the TPC website, because this is the kind of thing that, oh, gee, what was that? I would listen to it over and over again. It really helps me out then. Well, that's a good point, Randy. I'm glad you brought that up because we will put the video on. We're putting all these Zoom videos on the website uh, uh, under the presentations. And something else I learned from the geologists that Jackson Hole have been doing this very well for a long time. Uh, and that works nicely. These slides that I use tonight are all already on there. I've already put those under uh, presentations. And so they're available to anybody that wants the slides that they're, they're on uh, right now. So. But I, I, I'd like to hear more feedback for David's question because, you know. Yeah, oh. and, well, I, and my, my basic question behind that is while this one was mostly uh, uh, structural. You, yeah, it was structured, but if it had to be very interactive where people were asking a lot of questions, uh, like, oh, show me, I don't see what's happening on my computer. Um, do you, we think we could make that work? Yeah, so, so you I use know the it's chat hard function. That would be good, David. That would you be use the chat function. The yeah, chat well, helps, but if I wanted to um, go to my own library and kind of replicate what I was being shown. I don't have that facility. <laughs> and sharing screens and stuff like that. I, I think we would have to probably limit the 10 people like, like we did with the other yeah. uh, classes because if you really, I mean, if you've only got an hour and a half or two hours maximum, you know, I, I'm afraid you miss people if you get too many on board. And that's, that's why I, we wanted to really test this yeah. stuff tonight. I think if it's a highly interactive class, you'll have to have a very limited number of people on. So, yeah. but yeah, I think it went really well. Other, I, I mean, very. Yeah. I agree. Well, as, I attended. I attended the two um, uh, weekend classes for Lightroom, and much of it was Lauren and Michael, you know, with their um, screen, you know, up on a big screen, you know, going through and showing us what they did. It worked, and, and this would work the same way. It, you know, again, how much can you ask questions? But I think it definitely could be done. This was good. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. I, I thought, I personally thought this was great. I can't imagine a better um, method for teaching us all this information than just watching it on Zoom. So. Of course, I joined the photography club when I moved here, which was just before COVID. So I've never been to your live uh, <laughs> learning lessons, but I thought this was really effective. I can't even imagine live being more effective. Oh, live is awesome. <laughs> okay, I know. I will enjoy live when I and, and meeting people once we're all doing that. But I thought this was really effective. But you know, maybe, been, maybe we uh, could do this as a combination that you do a Zoom meeting that has 10 people and maybe you have a couple of them and then at the end of the month or something, bring those people together and then they'll have questions that may be needed to be done hands-on. Mm -hmm. It really would have been fun though to do the screen share function and have all of you be in your Lightroom catalog and share, you know, open your underwear drawer and you can show us your <laughs> part, part bikini uh, briefs in there. But uh, technically, you gotta be careful because it's almost overwhelming. Now, I've got two 27 inch screens right here so I can see a lot of real estate right now. But if you're trying to do it on a laptop, well, it's, it, it gets real hard. Uh, Zoom takes a lot of space. To, to support your point though, Oops. To support your point, though, these are the ways we can then explore our own Lightroom catalogs, our Lightroom databases, libraries, and then maybe there'll be a more um, valuable online class 
or at least uh, in-person class in the future because we're working, we're experimenting. And that's something that is sometimes really hard with Lightroom. It's like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to delete something. I don't want, but you've given us an opportunity to experiment and search and try out features that we haven't done. And that makes us a better student in the future. Does anybody have any suggestions for what class they would like to have? Because I'll tell you, it's a whole lot easier doing this this way than it is setting up, reserving a room, you know, and doing all the physical stuff, having everybody travel and all that. So, you know, I, I, I think there would be a lot of instructors be interested if you have uh, classes that you would like to suggest. Maybe you could send those today <coughs> and, you know, with your suggestions and we'll see what we can put together. You know, our original goal was we wanted one to two classes, uh, you know, every month, uh, at least most months. So we got a lot of people that want to teach and, and share their stuff. So it'd be fun to, fun to do. Well, if we remember from two years ago, or was it last year, that having a class in the winter time, you always have the possibility of getting snowed out. Yeah. That was last and maybe year. What yeah. we can do is do classes more fall and spring and do classes, Zoom classes, because we can be sure that we can still have them even if we get a snowstorm, which, I mean, we couldn't have had anything in February that we had to travel to. It was just snowing every day. Well, thank you all for, for coming tonight and, and being there. I enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. I really hope you'll go try this stuff and, and certainly send an email to me if you have questions. If you get into it, we can always set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom class. Uh, you know, David is invested club resources to have this available so we can set something up on the fly uh, where we can share screens back and forth and we can actually watch exactly what you're doing if you have a question and, and I'll be happy to do that anytime. Very good, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lauren, and appreciate it. Lauren. Thank you, Lauren, it was, it was thank excellent. You. Excellent, Lauren. Thank, thanks so much. Yeah. Hey, and Lauren, if you can hang on a second. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. we'll let everybody else get off. <laughs> And I have a couple of things, but uh, 